sorry. Morning. I cannot hop over to that camera. Though. Yeah. Was I looking at the right yes. camera? Okay. Yes. I was like, I didn't yeah, see a light perfect. on. So I was like, I hope I'm looking at the right camera. Yeah, it looked, it looked yeah, good. I was watching, okay. I was watching okay. on the screen. You were perfect. Okay. You're good. So okay. I can oh. only direct to okay. the Stand by. Okay. Should I? Should I say anything about technical? Okay. Apologies. Ready. Aloha and welcome to a live virtual forum on the University of Hawaii at Manoa Spring 2022 reopening. You know, we have to apologize. We had little smoke kind, you know, technical difficulties in the <laughs> beginning, but that is just really been the nature of how things have been occurring the past couple of years. So thanks for rolling with us. Uh, we'll reintroduce ourselves again. I'm Moani K. Ella Navarro, uh, the moderator for this afternoon. We thank you again if you're just joining us and you can hear us now. Aloha, welcome. We are inside the beautiful College of Social Sciences digital studios right here at the Sinclair Student Success Center. Just gorgeous. We love, yes. we love it. Here today to answer your questions, we will also reintroduce our wonderful guests. We have UH Manoa Provost Michael Bruno. Thanks so much for being with us. We also have Dr. Lee Buen Conseho Lum. Yes, she is the Associate Dean of the John A. Burns School of Medicine and liaison to the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's COVID-19 Pandemic Response Team. Did I get that right, Lee? Yes. Okay, we got that. Lots of kuleana, <laughs> lots of responsibility. We thank you both so much for being with us right here on set. You know, um, we have had so many of your questions come in and we're gonna get to as many of those as possible in this two hour session. We wanna remind you as well, you can also email your questions throughout the forum if you haven't done so already. Send them into eForum at hawaii.edu. Just be sure though to use your hawaii.edu email account. Questions will be limited to UH students, faculty, and staff. Now the forum is also being recorded and will be posted in its entirety on uhnews.org by the end of day, Monday, December 20. We'd like to acknowledge that everyone in the studio is following UH COVID-19 guidelines and has been cleared to be right here on campus by the LumaSite UH Daily Health app. Everyone in the studio and control room all wearing face masks this afternoon, except of course for Michael, Lee and I, so you can hear us. So again, we'd like to also mention all three of us are also fully vaccinated. So we're going to transition over to you, Provost Bruno, some opening words for us. Uh, mahalo, mahalo, Pawnee. I hope you're all having a good ending to the semester, just a week or so to go. And I want to begin by congratulating all of you uh, all who are graduating. Well done on completing your degrees during this time of great uncertainty. For our students, who are continuing to persevere. We are with you every step of the way. Keep up the great work and we will find the resources to support you. Let me also thank our faculty and our staff who have continued to support our mission of student learning, world-class research, and service out in the community. You continue to inspire us in the ways that you are operating and finding solutions to really challenging problems creatively and in a way uh, using innovation that, that I think is gonna stay with us in the, in the months and years, years to come. We look forward to next semester, which is gonna be a big step to our normal, most say our new normal of life here on campus. The campus, our classrooms, labs are all going to be back to full capacity 
and our op operations will all be open from the dining halls to the museums, all offices, and all of our meeting and conference rooms. They are all going to be fully open. Of course, the Omicron vi variant is now top of mind for all of us. And we continue to track the developments and are following guidance from our health experts, like our experts sitting <laughs> right next to me. And uh, our health and wellness team continues to provide us with extraordinary guidance as we move forward. Okay, before we get started, I do want to wish you and your loved ones a very joyous and I hope restful holiday season and the happiest of New Year's with all good health. Mahalo. And mahalo so much, Provost. Of course, let's make it a great 2022. Yeah. And of course, we do mention, Lee, you and your team have been so helpful throughout this entire experience with all of the mana'o and guidance that you folks have um, left with us. So we, I think, are about to start with our uh, questions, our ninao that have come in. We want to set the stage with that. Um, you know, the first day of classes, though, we do want to mention already coming up January 10th. As of January 3rd, 2022, to be on campus, all students, faculty, staff, and visitors uh, will be required to be fully vaccinated or have a medical and religious exemption approved by the university. Now, those of you who are not yet fully vaccinated, two weeks from your final dose, or you know who have exemptions are required to submit a negative test weekly to be on campus. Now, with the vaccination requirements, uh, implemented by UH. The campus is considered fully vaccinated by the Center Right for Disease Control and Prevention. So physical distancing is no longer required, which does allow us to fully reopen our campus. So with that being said, let's begin with our first set of questions that were submitted by members of our campus community. And I just want to double check on something. Lee, so many, uh, you know, uh, versions of, of how to pronounce the variant. It's Omicron. I think it's Omicron. Omicron. I actually looked it up okay. and did the Google dictionary. Okay, I'm glad thing. I asked. The other, yeah, I think Omicron. It's Omicron. Okay. <laughs> so with that being said, you know, this is actually a question directed to both of you. Mm -hmm. So you decide who would like to take the first swing at it. But this question basically asking, how will the university respond to the Omicron variant? I'll let Lee begin at least. Uh, I can okay. jump in. Sure. So I think it's really important that um, for everyone to know that the measures that we're currently taking now are really the best protection. Um, and that is all of our multi-layered prevention strategies, i.e. Uh, staying home if you're sick, checking yourself daily through the Lumicite UH app, uh, being fully vaccinated, uh, and or if you have an approved medical or religious exemption, then doing the testing uh, you know, by the approved schedule, uh, and, and just really paying attention to your, to your surroundings, not only on campus, but also off campus. You know, we, uh, we are all learning more about this variant, and uh, there's new news coming out every day. Uh, and, um, you know, I think within the next two weeks, the world will know a lot more mm. about it. Uh, so far, it does seem that uh, it, it is spread quite easily, um, perhaps maybe more, uh, more easily transmissible than the Delta, which is what I think makes everyone really nervous. Um, but reports uh, from other countries are showing that they do tend to be milder symptoms in those who are fully vaccinated or boosted. And so the caveat is that we still have many, many people in this community and also around the world who are unvaccinated. And so I think what everyone is really worried about is the impact on the unvaccinated. But for us here at Manoa, and, and we'll hear later, we're, I think, very happy, so happy to report very, very high vaccination rates amongst our students and our um, employees. And that should give us, you know, great um, relief in addition to the masking and lumicite and all the rest of the precautions. So we'll sure. just, we'll keep on uh, monitoring very closely. All those steps combined, yep. very important. And Provost, uh, any words that you have to the question that came into us? I, I do want to say, I, in, in our view, the Manoa campus is probably the safest place to be on mm -hmm. Oahu. Um, our numbers, our vaccination numbers are extraordinary. 
Sure. I cannot find a, uh, a similar rate anywhere else on any other campus. Um, as of this morning when I checked, we have nearly 14,000 students have registered. Only 2% of those students have requested an exemption, meaning 98% mm -hmm. have submitted their vaccination. So um, that's an extraordinary number. And the, and the numbers for employees, while I don't have them right now, and, and that's continuing to, to, uh, to change, we are way into the 90s, 90% mm -hmm. uh, above 90% on employees. So um, our campus is as safe as it can be. And, uh, and what that means to all of us is that we have collectively um, a uh, protection against any variant, this new one or any, any future ones. And, and the most important thing, and people have to re realize and remember that the, the, the real uh, strength of the vaccine, the purpose of the vaccine is to reduce the severity of illness and to avoid uh, hospitalization and you know the, the other outcomes, long COVID and the other outcomes that, that we worry about. Um, those can be mitigated against by, by getting that vaccine. And you know, I'm, I'm talking now to an audience largely of our campus community and almost all of them have already been vaccinated. Sure. Yeah, those are impressive numbers yeah. that, that have come in. So, so thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, you know, we do also want to transition to um, this next question that comes in. And it says, you know, if the Omicron variant starts spreading and becomes an alarming issue before the spring 2022 semester starts, uh, will the school be transitioning towards uh, or, or back to online classes again? This one is for you. Provost, or will there still be social physical distancing classes as planned? I'll begin by repeating what we've been saying. Uh, in the eyes of the CDC, we are a fully vaccinated campus. Um, that provides us with uh, opportunities for in-person learning that don't exist on campuses that can't say the same thing. Um, and so with that in mind, and also knowing that at, from the start of the pandemic, the university was carved out as an essential business. And I think some in the audience may not know that even during the height of the pandemic, even prior to having vaccinations, we were conducting in-person instruction in areas like the medical school where uh, we believe that effective student learning could not happen online. Um, many of our laboratory classes were still conducted in person. Um, that was at the time of the height of the pandemic without vaccination. So um, in my view, um, we are not going back to online. Um, it, would, it, would take, it would take a lot for us to go online. We are making no plans to switch to online in the spring. We think we have taken every precaution, fully vaccinated campus that is still requiring wearing masks. Sure. And uh, I think maybe Lee can add to that, but I, I, I feel very comfortable just saying we're gonna continue to plan to be in person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the thing that um, I think differentiates us and our campus from other, other college campuses across the country that are also fully vaccinated is that we are requiring masks. Mm -hmm. And so that is really, uh, and numerous studies have shown that the masks actually are much more important than physical distancing. Uh, and that has been shown in elementary schools and crowded buses and, and other places. And so the key is really to keep the mask on. And then of course we're doing the, the Lumicite daily and, and other things, so yeah. yeah. Great. Um, you know, so this question, it, you know, we, we wanna make sure that we even though you have responded the way that you've had, uh, Provost, I uh, just want to make sure that this question is still asked. Um, if we are to switch back to hybrid or all online, uh, will there be any financial assistance for those who move to Hawaii, sign leases, and then have all their classes switched to Zoom? So as I said, right now, there's, there's zero plans to, to move back uh, to online. I, I will say this to whomever uh, wrote that question and, 
and to others who may have the same question, um, don't worry. Um, we are committed to you having not only the, the learning experience that you signed up for, uh, but also the college campus experience that you signed up for. Um, we are progressing with plans, and we'll get back. We'll get to these later on in the in the questions. I know, but um, we are making full preparations for a fully open campus, and we're committed to that. And so, in my view, we are we are not going to get to that point where you might, as a student, say, "Hey, this is not what I what I uh, signed up for and am paying tuition for." We're going to make sure you're getting your money's worth. Uh, this next question uh, to you, Lee, will the COVID-19 vaccination be a requirement on the health clearance form permanently? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Uh, scientists around the world are still doing ongoing studies to see uh, and determine um, you know, how frequently do we need vaccinations, right? There's been a lot of talk in the media, you know, will this Will COVID turn endemic, meaning kind of like the flu, where uh, there's a, always a low level of the virus circulating? Uh, and um, my guess is is probably, you know, at least for the next probably year and a half. I mean, we really have to get the world vaccinated uh, and fully vaccinated before, uh, you know, I think we can feel more comfortable that this is close to being over. But, you know, viruses are really sneaky and smart and they, uh, they, they live, their entire purpose is to continue living. And so they're gonna continue to find ways to, you know, evolve, but they wanna just stay around, but be mild. So, so that's the hope. So we don't know at this point. Um, and uh, I think by, you know, sometime middle or late next year, there'll be more information uh, in terms of, do we need ongoing boosters? Um, and, and things like that. And really until those questions are answered, um, then uh, th I think there's no intention to change the current state law. You know, wh wh right now we, we of course have other uh, infectious diseases uh, that are required. So measles, mumps, and rubella and other things, but all of those requirements were put in place after years of study. So. Sure, we're just not there yet. Not there yet. That's what it sounds like. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks so much, Lee. Um, this next question um, heading to you. Uh, provost, how many courses will be in person in the spring 22 semester? I knew that question was going to come up, <laughs> and so I came prepared. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this has been a, um, an evolving situation with us working with the various deans, associate deans, and in particular the chairs who are faculty. Um, the answer is that the, uh, the degree to which courses are offered in person versus online varies quite a bit from college to college. Um, as I've looked into this, um, a lot of that is driven by the mission of the college. And so an example would be the College of Education, which has a mission to educate our future teachers, of course, but also our future education administrators. Um, most of those students are full-time, usually teachers. So they need to have courses offered in an online environment, very often asynchronous. Another set of their population are our neighbor island students, uh, students who can't travel here for in-person courses. So those courses need to be online. So it was no surprise after uh, seeing this, uh, that the College of Education has a relatively high percentage of courses offered online, and by relatively high, it's around 45 percent mm. are, are offered online. Um, but close to 10 percent of their courses offer options, either online or in person. And that is something I wanted to mention, that, that most of our units are, have more than 10% of their courses with sections that are either in person or online. So students wanting those courses, something like 10% of our courses across campus, hundreds of courses, within those courses you have sections that are online or in person, so you can choose. Um, and that, to me that's a great thing. Um, but the range, so we go from the school of architecture that has zero percent 
in an online only mm -hmm. modality. Uh, the College of Engineering is just about 0% online only at 3%. Uh, SOEST, uh, also another one, they're around 15%. I should say School of Medicine is for all intents and purposes in person. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we should say that too. Um, and then many of our colleges are in the 20% range. Uh, for online only, and by that I mean the College of Arts, Languages, and uh, Literature, um, CTAR, the College of Tropical, Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, um, the College of Natural Sciences, um, they are all in the 20-23% range for online. Um, and then you come up to the next, uh, those that are in the 30% range include nursing, and social work. And then you do have a few units that are in the 40% range. So the business school, social sciences, um, and College of Education, as I said, are up there in the 40%. The School of Hawaiian Knowledge is a bit of an outlier in that they are um, uh, having about 70% of their courses online. There are many reasons mm -hmm. for that. and. Uh, and we have been working with the faculty. So all of these have been driven by the faculty who we have trusted uh, with student learning. And, and uh, you know, with that, I will say that, um, you know, and from the perspective of effective student learning, as opposed to prior semesters, uh, virtually all of our laboratory courses are in person, very few. Um, I know that um, chemistry and physics have some hybrid courses or are offering the choice of online and, and in person, sure. but, but they, they are uh, they're open to all of their students being in an in-person environment. I think that's really critical. And I know that engineering and architecture with the hands-on design and, and studios, those are all in person. So that's top of mind for for myself and, and really the associate deans and the deans is uh, where is the most effective student learning? What sure. are the modes for the most effective student learning? And I think, I think what we're seeing here, really including in this variability, is that this is program by program. Mm -hmm. what, what are the best modalities for our students? Yeah. Understandably so, right? Thank you so much for that, Provost. And, you know, we are going to move on to this next question here, um, which is also directed to you, Provost Bruno. In what ways can students promote more in-person activities? Uh, you know, this one coming in online and um, directed, directed to you. Okay, so now I'm going to speak directly to the students. The campus is fully open. The city and county have finally removed all restrictions on gatherings. The only restriction that remains for us on this campus are check in with the Lumicite and wear a mask when you're indoors. Outside of those restrictions, it's game on. So uh, if you have a student club and you want to meet in person, go ahead and schedule in person. If you have an idea for a student activity, go ahead and give us your ideas. I know that the folks in our um, student, student success area, our folks in the residence halls, um, our student athletes are all looking for that energy that comes from students showing up, uh, the crowds at our, at our athletic events, and we wanna see we want to see students back out on campus, in our eateries, um, also the student clubs. Um, if you have any difficulty at all, email me and we'll make it happen. It, it felt so nice to hear you, you know, say that and it's like a, you shall pass, you know, pass <laughs> go and you get 200 bucks. That was great. That was great to hear that. And of course, we want to encourage um, you watching us uh, online. If you have questions for Lee, for Provost Bruno, uh, feel free to email us. You can send in those questions to eForum at hawaii.edu. Uh, we just ask you be sure to use your hawaii.edu email account. 
uh, questions this afternoon limited to UH students, faculty, and staff. Okay, and we are moving on through. You folks are doing great. I know there's a lot of information to discuss, great things for us to get through. Um, we're going to move on to this question, and it is directed to you, Provost. It says, I prefer teaching in person, and I don't understand why UH Manoa wants to return to in-person teaching. No, I think you said, I, I understand. And um, I'm sorry, and I understand, excuse me, why UH Manoa wants to return to in-person teaching, but does Manoa benefit in any way from having more students actually attend online? That is a fantastic question because it is something that we are talking about on a, a, a daily basis right now. Um, and this goes to the heart of what is the future of higher education here in Hawaii and throughout the U.S. and actually throughout the world. Higher education professionals are asking themselves this question all the time. So uh, given this experience during the pandemic um, where our faculty have uh, to a great extent um, become expert in the delivery of their course materials in an online environment. Um, what do we know now about the student and the program needs for either the online delivery of, of instruction material or a mix? So is the future of the university to have a permanent mix, maybe even a permanent set of options? Like I said, this coming semester, we will have something like 10% of our courses having both online and in-person options. Well, is that something we want to have on a permanent basis without the risks associated with the pandemic? Just in the normal course of our work together, do we want to have those options? I've heard from many students who say that the online option allows them to have a, a uh, a more flexible schedule mm. uh, for caregiving at home, for for working, um, and uh, you know they don't have to fight traffic. They don't have to, you know, hunt for parking on campus. Um, you know, that's one set of students. At the same time, we have other sets of students, in particular students who are not from this place, who have traveled here, and and are living in our residence halls or out in apartments. You know, they they want more of an on-campus feel. So. Um, so there's, there's, I wouldn't call it a tension between those two, but to me it's something that we need to get right. And the only way to get it right is by gathering more information, information from our customers uh, who are our students, and also information from our eventual employers. So uh, when it comes to student learning, student satisfaction, student career success, what are the avenues that, that best fulfill those goals? Is it, is it the in-person? Is it a mix of in-person, online? I believe it's the latter. Mm. I, I think the future will, will have a mix of, of uh, in-person, online. I know that many of our faculty, even before the pandemic, were doing hybrid instruction where they were sending out materials um, online to students and the students would review videos or read documents and then be ready to discuss in the in-person class and and I hear from many of our faculty that you know they've learned to do that even better now with new tools and resources that have sprung up like crazy during the pandemic so uh, so I think you'll see more and more faculty adopting a hybrid and I think you're gonna see sets of students wanting those options well, would the administration prefer us to continue offering our course as hybrid or revert completely to in-person? You know, we've been very cautious, I think all of us, mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. start in, in not being overly prescriptive with our faculty. Um, I've always trusted faculty to understand student learning um, in their specific discipline. You have a, you have a, uh, a learning environment associated with with medical <laughs> professionals, with uh, developing and, and educating our future uh, physicians. Um, it, 
only those only those faculty can understand fully what what is required for effective student lear learning. The same is true in a in a chemistry course, a math course, a a uh, humanities course, uh, architecture, etc. Um, so we've been we've. We've been careful over the last two years to not be overly prescriptive. So I would say in response to that question, um, if you think that your, your course can be developed in a way that provides even more effective student learning in a hybrid mode rather than 100% in person, um, nobody is going to stand in your way. Okay. Okay. Uh, Provost? This one also coming in for you. Why is it so difficult to get advisor appointments and support? We feel very much on our own. And do the appointments have to only be with student advisors? First of all, second question first, absolutely not. Um, not only with uh, these student advisors. We have student advisors located in each college and school. We also have advisors in the uh, the Manoa Advising Center. Um, uh, athletics has their own set of advisors, and we have advisors in different different settings, including uh, residence halls. Um, we also have tutors around campus. Um, but we find that many students find effective advising from their teachers, uh, particularly those students who are in their second, but in particularly the third and fourth year of instruction. Now they're in their major and they're interacting day to day with, with their uh, teachers who are in the labs, studios, et cetera. So, um, so to me, for, for a student to really get the most out of their experience, uh, they should always look for those different avenues, um, including those teachers who I know are, are ready and willing to provide advice on everything from coursework to career aspirations. Um, to the first question, um, that's pretty troubling. If a student has looked for advising and has been unable to get a response, um, I would uh, suggest to those students that they begin um, with their dean, if possible. But you know, if they're in a first year uh, situation, uh, that might not be as possible, you know, and uh, many have not yet declared a major. So um, I would say email me and I will put you in touch with the right person. Um, but to my knowledge, um, our advisors have been online since the start of the pandemic. Um, we have various avenues for students to follow. Um, but again, I'll end with um, if you're having difficulty, email me. Okay. And just in case, uh, if, if our viewers, of course, just want another reminder of your email. mbruno at hawaii.edu. Okay, we heard it here, and thank you so much for that answer, Provost. We um, transition into this one, you know, this one asking, will it continue to be so challenging to get the classes we need? Business 250, English 101, any class with the lab, all having no luck. We very much hope to have in-person classes next semester even if masks are required. Wow, so whoever wrote this identified a couple of the most difficult classes. <laughs> traditionally, <laughs> to, right? To, <laughs> traditionally. <laughs> so in particular, Business 250, um, uh, we know that, uh, that the sections filled up very quickly. Uh, very often, we will work with those departments and those schools and colleges to give them the resources to open up additional sections. So that, that will um, happen in many cases. Um, I would say for those, those cases when you know, you're in a major, it's a uh, really uh, high demand course, um, going back to the advisor, work with your advisor, or very often the associate dean is a really good place to, uh, to stop in and, and ask about alternatives ask about the possibility of sections, additional sections being open, then maybe I'm going to get an email. Um, can we get the resources for a lecturer? And the answer is yes. Um, so, uh, so that's number one. For English 101, we know always high demand, fall yeah. and spring. Mm -hmm. um, again, an area where we routinely add sections. 
Um, with regards to in-person, I know that English 101 is uh, one of those courses where they have approximately half of their sections online and half of the sections in person. Okay. So students can pick and choose. I think the Business 250, I think those are all in person to my knowledge. And uh, likewise, for all intents and purposes, the, uh, the labs are, are in person. So um, I understand where that student was coming from and asking that question. Um, I, I would just say be proactive. Sure. Don't hesitate to go to your advisor or, or go to the associate dean, like the person sitting next to me, <laughs> who will make magic happen and uh, either point you to a different course uh, that will satisfy the requirements or um, begin the process in looking for perhaps an additional section. Okay, great advice from Provost Bruno. We've heard it first right here. And, you know, let's um, actually bring Lee back into the conversation. You know, Lee, um, this one directed to you, will this semester be open to exempted and chosen unvaxxed who have not contributed to the spread any more than a vaxxed individual? Sure. So I think um, before I answer the question directly, I think it's important for folks to know that, um, and I think this comes from the question of breakthrough infections, right? We're hearing that people who are fully vaccinated uh, are getting, are getting uh, you know, infected. And so, well, why should I bother getting a vaccine, right? So certainly understand uh, where that's coming from. Uh, but there's actually good evidence that uh, people, even though f folks that are fully vaccinated and, and get infected, that's the breakthroughs, uh, they're still much less likely to get infected compared to someone who is unvaccinated. Uh, and even compared to persons who previously had COVID but never got the vaccine subsequently. Uh, and there's very strong evidence now from around the world that supports that. The other thing that's important to know is that if a fully vaccinated individual uh, gets, uh, contracts the virus, they tend to have uh, milder symptoms and also tend to have a shorter duration where they're infectious. So in other words, the unvaccinated person actually can spread it for much longer and, and, and spread it much more efficiently. Uh, in fact, an unvaccinated person can spread it, you know, maybe 10 to 20 times higher than a fully mm. vaccinated person. Um, and the rates in hospitalization are really where, you know, the, the most dramatic are. So, so that's just kind of the, the background information. And so, again, for this semester, everyone has to be fully vaccinated or have an approved exemption. Um, and, the, and that's different than the fall. So, so the, the question was about chosen unvax. So now, actually it's, it's pretty close to the deadline, uh, actually surpassed the deadline. Um, all, all requests for medical or religious exemption should have already been filed. And if they're approved, then they do need to have testing. Uh, and that's really important. So um, that's the only way to keep our campus safe. Uh, is to do the continued testing for those who, uh, for whatever reason, are unvaccinated. Okay. Any other comments that, that maybe you'd like to put in there, Provost? No. Yeah. I think, we, I think she we answered addressed it. it. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we move on to this next question. Um, back to you, Provost Bruno. Uh, quote, it's saying, here is a comment from someone, um, and I will get, actually, Provost, I'll give you a chance to respond. It's just a comment that I'm gonna read out loud, excuse me. I think it would be great if there are classes that advertise online and stay online and classes that advertise in person and stay in person on campus. Please cater to all the students, but allow your nearby students out of state in dorms and, in, and apartments a shot at a normal college campus. That is a comment coming in um, to our email forum. Yeah, um, that, uh, that comment um, really resonates with me. Uh, we are doing everything necessary to ensure that our students experience a quote-unquote normal college campus experience. We really are. We're, um, we have already accelerated plans on uh, our eateries and, and you know, the the, uh, the Warrior Rec Center has been open, but uh, they will be um, uh, doing away with uh, a lot of the protocols that have been in place for quite a long time. And, 
and uh, so they'll they'll be able to have more more machines and others open um, uh, uh, sporting events and other events are going to be happening at much much greater rate so um, so I, I really believe that starting in January we're going to have uh, what all of us would recognize as as our normal campus. Um, I, the first part of that comment may uh, kind of I, maybe was from the early part of uh, our process for registering. We know that there were some changes to course modalities. Um, we put a stop to to any changes uh, roughly a week, maybe two weeks after the initial groups of students were registering. We go in waves of students uh, with, with different uh, student populations being offered first, first opportunities. Um, but uh, we, did, we did have a few departments, a few programs ask for changes a bit too late in the game. So we just kind of stopped that and um, for the last several weeks, what you see is what you get. And, uh, and we're doing uh, everything necessary to just make sure that's, that, that's, that stays true. Duly noted. Um, what we're going to do right now is we're going to transition into a lightning round and try and get through <laughs> as many questions as we uh, as we can during um, you know a kind of a shorter allotted time. Uh, so let's go ahead and start that off. Um, we will direct this first question of our lightning round to you, Provost, and it says, "What is UH Manoa doing to accommodate the students who cannot attend in-person classes due to their health status?" of their immediate families? Um, we're, we're very conscious of, of that fact. And it, this goes not only for our students, it's also for some of our faculty who, uh, who have um, you know, um, concerns about, about being in person, in particular at the start of the semester. Um, so uh, it's for that reason that we have uh, left it to the faculty and, uh, and the programs to decide on the mix of online mm -hmm. and in-person courses. I, I, do, I think it's obvious, but it's impossible for us to offer every single course in every single modality. Uh, we're doing our best. Like I said, we have a fair number of courses that offer sections in different modalities, online, in-person. Um, we do hope that um, particularly for the lower level courses, uh, students who prefer online will be able to find enough online courses to have a full uh, course of study. Um, and the same with in-person, we think it's going to be uh, quite easy to find uh, those in-person courses if that's what they want. Okay, sure. And we transition into this next one. Will at-risk students have the opportunity to join the classroom via Zoom as in-person classes begin again? Uh, that, that is more difficult. If a student signs up for an in-person class, they're expected to show up to an in-person class. Okay. Um, we have had situations arise during the semester. Um, an example would be a student becomes ill maybe with COVID, maybe some other illness. Um, these situations pop up even prior to the pandemic, sure. right? Um, in those cases, our faculty um, are accustomed to mm -hmm. providing accommodation. Um, even in environments like the medical school mm -hmm. where in-person instruction is so critical, um, I know that our faculty do everything that is necessary to make sure that student continues to learn um, but not through an entire semester. Sure. If a student signs up for an in-person course um, outside of maybe you know one week, two week periods, the student is expected to show up. Okay. And uh, this um, uh, individual asking you to address how the kickoff for spring 22, 2022 will affect travel for staff and students for university related programming. I suspect that that pertains to university community travel. Um, um, we have changed the requirements for for university travel. Um, as of last month, the uh, the units, that is the colleges and the schools, have the authority to approve travel on um, a variety of different funds. Um, 
I would say, in general, non-university funds. Um, the president delegated to me the authority to approve travel on university funds, that is, general funds or tuition funds. People, don't, this is kind of inside baseball, but <laughs> uh, let's just say state funds um, can be used and approval can be granted for student and employee travel, um, uh, both intra, uh, uh, interstate um, or uh, within the state and um, uh, international and domestic travel. And in fact, today I approved um, several sets of uh, student travel and, and faculty travel. So uh, that, that freeze, let's not, it's, it's not gone, it's not you know, yeah. totally open, but uh, the approvals can be, can be provided and are being provided. It's ongoing, yeah. yeah. So, okay, uh, this next question in our lightning round, Provost, Mayor Blangiardi's emergency order does not differentiate between essential and designated businesses. Does this mean that the order applies to all businesses and the university no longer has essential business guidelines to follow? How does this impact non-instructional gatherings and activities, you know, college level new student orientations, fairs, grant related meetings it's really simple the restrictions are gone yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, you know we've said this a few times earlier but um yeah uh, we were really grateful and thankful to the mayor for, for lifting those restrictions it, it's it's been difficult on campus you know everybody wanted to talk about football yeah. <laughs> it was it was not just about football sure. um, it was also about other gatherings that we all believe could be conducted in a safe way on campus and now thankfully can be so. yeah. even music department events concerts mm -hmm. things like oh, yeah. that you know yep. where students Theater, dance, yeah, yeah really supported by um, the audiences. So next question to you, Provost, do any events, academic or non-academic related, held on campus need Provost approval at this point before the event can be held? For an example, uh, here, given an external organization wants to host an event on campus, does the event coordinator at this point need to ask for approval? That's a tricky question right there. <laughs> so so um, academic, um, uh, special academic events that are associated with an existing course um, always require approval. Um, uh, you know, in particular, if, if those events require the assignment of a classroom um, or maybe a, a larger room, that, that uh, there is a specific path that, that we follow in approving those. Um, a month ago, I delegated to our deans and the, uh, their directors, including the vice provost level and uh, research center directors. Um, they all now have the authority to approve non-academic events, uh, receptions and other sorts of gatherings. Um, um, on campus, you know, uh, outdoors or indoors, uh, with the only uh, the, o the only uh, catch is that all participants need to be cleared via lumicide, mm -hmm. and if they're indoors, they need to wear a mask. Um, but then the person added a third set, which is third party. Mm. I do need to approve uh, a third party um, gathering of any sort on campus. So. If an external organization wishes to use one of our venues or a part of our campus for some kind of an activity, a, uh, a conference, a, you know, um, concert, whatever it might be, um, I, I, think, I think our deans and, and others on campus know that they, they have to come uh, eventually to, to um, my office. And then in those events, I would then partner with um, our facilities team and our um, Department of Pub Public Safety to make sure that everything is, is, is proper. And uh, so there's three different sets of categories sure. there. Sure, okay. And you know, anyone coming to campus will need to have a vaccination or show proof of a negative COVID test taken within 48 hours from a UH approved facility or is the proof of a negative COVID test only allowed if someone has received an approved exemption 
for the vaccine from UH. And I'll let Lee also address <laughs> this, but <laughs> very quickly, um, we decided mm -hmm. in the in the COVID team uh, some time ago that it would be it would be uh, really um, actually unrealistic to to force a, for example, a um, a contractor to apply for an exemption, um, and so f for that it, for that reason, um, visitors to campus need to either show proof of vaccination or a negative test. Um, but those they're not being considered somehow for an exemption. That's only employees and students. But I don't mm -hmm. know if Lee, you have anything to. Yeah, no, I think it's it's uh, simpler to administer and actually is, you know, very close to uh, what is in place for City and County of Honolulu, right? If we are going into restaurants or other places, we have to, um, you know, we have to show our vaccine card. And I know there is a related question. If we don't have access to Lumicite, then do we bring our vaccine card? And the answer is, is yes. Mm -hmm. um, if someone, uh, say, for a football game, right, if they are unable to upload their negative test to Lumicite, then they can certainly bring a copy. Uh, and the staff have been trained to, you know, really kind of detect um, fake ones. You know, nothing is 100%, but sure. really we, we trust our community that everyone wants to do the right thing and keep everyone safe. So uh, that was definitely the simplest to just have everyone adhere to Lumicite. And, um, you know, for, for consistency and, again, staff training and, and everyone, so. Okay. Can I just point out sure. how many associate deans of medical schools out there know what is happening for football fans getting oh. into a football yeah. game? <laughs> that just shows you how involved <laughs> Lee has been yes. in every aspect of our work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, we appreciate that. And um, this one will take one more question before mm -hmm. we take a little break. Mm -hmm. uh, and we thank you again for sticking with us through this uh, informational, awesome, you know, informational two-hour forum. Uh, this one for you, Provost, you know, anyone coming to campus is also required to use Lumicide. If they don't have access to it, oh, actually, Lee, you mm -hmm. you actually I, did I already point that it. out. That's right. Mm -hmm. So why don't we go to the next one before we head to break? How about this one? Um, how will the Honolulu City and County's December 1st proclamation, no capacity limits, no mitigation plan, impact non-academic gatherings on the UH Manoa campus? Well, that's that's a uh, constant theme in these. I, th it, I think it demonstrates how um, how how much of our community is looking forward to a, a return to normal campus activity. So the answer is uh, the new order lifted the restrictions, and uh, and we are looking forward to going back to full activities indoor and outdoors on campus. Okay, and with that, Provost Lee, we will take a short break, uh, about five minutes or so. We, we also want to encourage you, you know, continue to send in questions that, that you'd like Provost or Lee to address. Uh, you can send in those questions to eForum at hawaii.edu. Stay with us. We will be back on the other side of the break in about five minutes. Aloha. I think that wasn't terrible.
Aloha and welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is a live virtual forum on the University of Hawaii at Manoa's spring 2022 semester. I'm your moderator, Moani K. Alanabaro, joined by Provost Michael Bruno, as well as Dr. Lee Buenconsejo Lum, the Associate Dean at the John A. Burns School of Medicine in Kaka'ako, and liaison to the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's COVID-19 pandemic response team. Aloha to you both. And Aloha. Provost, I think we heard you a little bit. The first half wasn't that terrible, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have to lighten it up. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that was terrible, that first part. That was, that was great. And can I just take one minute um, and just say, because our audience can't see them, but we have a group of students working here um, helping to make this happen, and I really want to give a shout out to them. They're doing a awesome terrific job. job. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, folks. You have a great career in front of you, all of you. Yeah, we, we even had um, powdering our noses on set. <laughs> It's very, very professional. Mahalo nui to our crew. And why don't we get right back to questions? In fact, a lot have, have been coming in um, as we've been talking together. So we'll get to that shortly. Uh, before we get there, though, uh, let's just fire off with this first question that came in a few days earlier. Um, this one for you, Provost. Uh, what is the definition of non-academic and academic? Uh, for example, academic equals activities required to complete a listed course or to fulfill a research grant and everything else would be non-academic? I think that's effectively the case. We do have some activities um, that are in a gray area, so an activity related to um, a field project that may not be directly related to, you know, an a, a eventual um, learning outcome or, or a test or exam um, and maybe even as an optional uh, activity for students. We, we often see those kinds of things. So that's a, a gray area. But that definition of either it's uh, course related and by course we mean a scheduled four credit course or research um, activity. Um, we school um, and some of our other schools like nursing and social work have community-based mm -hmm. activities that are really, you know, go into student learning, contribute to student learning, but they're external out in the community. Okay. Uh, this next question, uh, I'll ask uh, you first. Uh, Lee, um, this one coming in saying, I'm wondering how the decision was made to return the Warrior Recreation Center to its original setup without social distancing and whether this decision was made since the recent emergence of the and Omicron, Omicron. <laughs> that is the word of, of the year, variant of the disease. Are we sure this is a safe course of action? Sure, that's a, a great question. So uh, because we uh, knew uh, we had already been requiring vaccination, full vaccination, uh, you know, from the fall. And so, again, I think that uh, really uh, was the key, uh, key decision point in terms of whether you know it was safe and, and how close uh, to you know so again was it safe to exercise because that's really the question right so um, again it, as long as people are being truthful with their daily symptom check i.e. no symptoms and they're doing their lumicyte and you know they they they're fully vaccinated um, it it should be okay you know but then omicron happened right so we just continue to watch but again like I said earlier. It's really important that we all um, just really pay attention to our surroundings, not just on campus, but in fact, more cases of transmission are likely to happen off campus. As Provost Bruno said, we're at above 95%, right? And so, um, but uh, you know, it's the holiday season, we're gonna go shopping in crowded places. I don't know how many people, uh, you know, took advantage of the uh, after Thanksgiving sales, mm -hmm. right? All of those types of crowded events, um, uh, religious gatherings, other things, you know, those, those pose uh, more risk, in fact, and and um, and especially if you have people coming in, uh, traveling from other areas. And so I think what the state is seeing, just like everywhere else, is that um, you know we really do have to be very 
uh, cautious if we're having family gatherings and people are traveling elsewhere, even if they're fully vaccinated, right? Um, because we no longer have the requirement to do the pre-travel testing for domestic travel, right? And so when we did have that, then I think we, you know, could feel a little bit more safe. But um, again, we just we just have to really see uh, how the next uh, month or so bears out. Sure. Uh, Provost, did you want to add to anything? I, you know, I, I use the gym all the time. Uh, I was there this morning and um, for anybody out there who hasn't been back to the gym, it's uh, by the time you get inside, you believe everybody in there is safe. Uh, the, the student employees there have a protocol that works like clockwork and everybody knows the drill. You, you, you step forward, you go to a uh, temperature scan, shows you have a normal temperature. Uh, the next step is show your luminous, lumicite that shows you are good to go. Next step is to show your UH, your valid UHID, pull down your mask, show the picture and you are the same, and then you're good to go. But you have to keep your mask on from that moment until you exit. Um, so I have to say, uh, in answer to that person's question, I, I, th I think uh, they have done a great job from the start. And mm -hmm. to Lee's point, um, with the vaccination and the masking, we think that we're in a safe environment. Sure, and and you heard it first. Uh, we may we may see you working out uh, <laughs> on a fellow treadmill. So we thank you uh, so much, Provost Bruno, for you know uh, walking us through the process. As many of us do try and get back to um, our old routine of working out at the uh, Warrior Rec Center. All right, we're gonna uh, roll on through to this next question as well. This one directed to you, Provost. Um, saying, you know, are instructors responsible for checking whether students are vaccinated or tested? If so, how do we go about doing that? So we've tried to make it as easy as possible for our faculty. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there is a requirement uh, for students. So students are not able to register for your class unless they can show proof of fully vaccinated, right? Um, or if they have an approved exemption, they need to show proof of a negative COVID test. Um, the way that the system is working is if they have a negative COVID test, that expires, if it's a PCR test, in seven days. And now, so that now it is no longer valid. And so, so um, if the instructor wishes, they can go into our system and uh, they have access to see who is, who is green, that everyone in the class is green. Not, uh, there's uh, protected health information. There's, they're not being able to discern one, one or the other, but uh, that everybody is good to go. Um, a, uh, an instructor can ask for a, uh, a lumicite you know, um, but we know that we have students and employees who don't have a smartphone. And so mm -hmm. to Lee's answer earlier, um, a valid uh, vaccine card or a written proof of a negative COVID test result are going to be okay. But we don't expect our faculty to be police officers. Sure. Um, you know, um, we, have, we have come up, we think, with a system that can assure them that everybody in front of them is either fully vaccinated or has a valid recent negative test result. And remember, uh, so far only 2% of our students have requested that mm -hmm. exemption. Okay. So these are only handfuls of students. Yeah. Uh, what, what do we do, this question asks Provost, if students adamantly refuse to wear their masks in the classroom? Is there support, staff, or security that we can call to help enforce this rule? What do we do if the situation escalates and jeopardizes the safety of the other students and instructor? Uh, first, I would say I would be shocked if this kind of scenario uh, appears on our campus. If it does, we do not want uh, the situation to escalate between the student and the faculty member. Um, our Department of Public Safety is able to respond, and so a call to DPS 
um, will result in a, a, an officer coming to the classroom and escorting that person off of campus um, because uh, that would be a violation uh, not only of our uh, protocols but also the student code of conduct and so that student would be subject to disciplinary action. And, you know, with that being said, we do want to remind everyone that all of these great responses that you're hearing from Lee and from Provost Bruno throughout this forum, uh, we are recording as we speak, and it will be posted in its entirety on uhnews.org on December 20th. So, again, if you do want to refer back to many of these helpful questions that have been coming through, uh, make sure that you click on to uhnews.org. And I was mistaken by that. It will be posted on December 13th in its entirety. Okay, so we are uh, you know, going to move on to actual questions that have been coming in as we've been speaking um, since we started at about two o'clock this afternoon. Let me scroll on through here. Um, this one coming in, asking, um, and, and either of you can jump in if, if you feel that this is one that you'd like to answer. On January 3rd, 2022, and as UH returns to a majority in-person instruction and on-campus activities, will the university also share updates related to a new non-COVID-19 telework policy? So, it might surprise people to know that prior to the pandemic, we did not have a formal telework policy, a formal policy that establishes guidelines for what it means to be teleworking. What is the environment in which the employee would be working from? Is it equipped properly with, um, with computer, with internet access? Uh, is it a safe environment, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so, you know, in a sense, there's there's a checklist that needs to be considered. So is this going to work? Um, so that would be um, normal operating procedures. Um, we, we, ne we didn't have it. Um, we do have a policy. It is in, I believe, the final stages of consultation with our, with our unions. Um, and I fully expect that that policy will be uh, complete and distributed and posted online prior to January 3rd. Uh, we all believe that this is essential to uh, not only the operations in the spring semester, but going forward. Sure. Because you can imagine there are always um, things that come up um, that, that m might lead one to say, okay, I'm going to uh, grant uh, telework permission to telework for X amount of time, um, even outside of a pandemic environment. Okay, okay so that is to be announced within Before. the, you know, yep. soon. coming soon. soon. Okay. Okay, and um, this question coming in, I have a question about spring 2022. What will happen if there is a rise in cases with the Omicron uh, variant? How will UH handle a rise in cases with the return to in-person activities? Uh, Lee? Sure, so the contact tracing processes that we have, so we're very fortunate at, uh, at Manoa to have the COVID response team, uh, which is run out of our uh, Manoa Student Health Services. And so they're still very active. Uh, and um, the key for, for all of this is just really um, again, first, uh, heightened awareness, right? And so that cold or sniffle or little sneeze that we think uh, might be allergies, uh, maybe you should get tested, right? That's, that's really the key is to have this heightened level of, of awareness. And like I said earlier, um, the whole world will know more uh, about the Omicron variant in, you know, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, there's new reports every day. Uh, so the first thing is just that awareness. And then if you suspect that you might be ill, stay at home and then get tested, right? And then if the test is positive, UH has its normal reporting mechanisms. Again, the COVID response team will do their usual contact tracing. Um, and, uh, and, and then we will just have to see, you, you know, it's um, if hopefully not, again, our vaccination rates are quite high. And 
plug for the boosters, uh, eligible for all who are 16 years old and older. And so there is actually evidence, uh, pretty good evidence, showing that the boost, that additional booster actually does help to protect uh, against the, uh, you know, these, these new variants. Um, nothing is 100%, but it certainly does look like getting a booster will be effective. And so, uh, so that, that will definitely help. Um, but, you know, depending on if, if there's a large cluster, I mean, we'll, we'll just have to really kind of take it as it comes. But uh, we're pretty confident that with the response measures that we have now and with all the protocols in place, uh, you know, if there's an isolated uh, person um, here and there, uh, we'll, we'll just continue what we've been doing this entire last two semesters uh, and really just, you know, keeping it under control. Our, our numbers are really quite low, um, even across the whole system. And, and uh, again, amazing teams, you know, who've worked hard to keep us safe. And I, th I think now I'm going to ask Lee to also <laughs> answer an associated <laughs> question uh, that came up this morning and we corresponded mm. about, um, and that is, so um, I, perhaps many would be surprised to hear that we have not had a single case of transmission in a classroom mm -hmm. since March of 2020. Um, but the question is, okay, what happens when that occurs, if that occurs, that you have a case and, and the student was on campus in a classroom, uh, what happens in that classroom, what should be the protocol? And mm -hmm. I think Lee provided some some good guidance that I think was consistent with what University mm -hmm. Health Services had planned. But right, maybe right. So, so with the contact tracing, uh, so so the again the first thing is um, if the COVID response team contacts you, whether you're a faculty staff, please respond quickly because okay. you know time is of the essence. Um, and um, but the advice is is of course for the individual, but depending on how many other people uh, you know were around and would be considered a close contact, then it might be reasonable for at least you know a day or three days or so to have that next class online. Um, and uh, and just again that gives time uh, for the contact tracing process to be completed. It also gives time for everyone else to get tested and to get the results. You know we're really fortunate because uh, pretty much um, although although the websites all have the disclaimer that it takes one to two days to get your test back, pretty much everything is coming back within 24 hours. And if you get the rapid PCR or the rapid antigen test, it's going to come back within 30 minutes. You know so the key is to um, again. Uh, follow what the contact tracing team and the code response team says but um, when if you know we had a, a situation um, once a long time ago at the med school where uh, one student was positive and so out of an abundance of, of caution uh, we moved everything back online just for a very short period of time uh, it really helped relieve everyone's anxiety too because sure. you know we're worried about our households and many of us may live in uh, you know high-risk households and so uh, that seems very reasonable uh, but again just for a really short amount of time because we have a lot of testing available mm -hmm. I think early on in the pandemic when everyone was having to wait days that's a difference that is that is not now I mean now we have tests everywhere yeah, yeah the availability is there rapid response right, right. okay right. very important um, this one coming in uh, stating with the full opening next year the traffic will increase for the safety of commuters, can we request that the city and county consider installing the bike route along Dole Street? Gee, I'm waiting for Lee to answer that, but. It makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the processes. I, but yeah, it I have no idea makes what. Sense. <laughs> uh, I don't know what kind of approvals we would need um, for that. That's certainly something that I'm philosophically in favor of. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yes, traffic is going to increase, but um, I don't. I don't know that we're expecting traffic to be any different than it was in sure. the uh, in the fall of nineteen uh, of uh, twenty nineteen. Um, but uh, yeah, we're I think oh, probably going to both say we're big proponents of everybody using a bike if they can. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, and again, we encourage you if uh, you are. Uh, joining us uh, just at this second hour, you know, if you do have questions, uh, go ahead and send them into us at eforum at hawaii.edu. Uh, you know, 
we'll take them, even if it's maybe we, ones that we can't answer <laughs> at this point. But we uh, acknowledge that, um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, your um, answers, if not answered here, will be at least addressed and answered at a later time. All right, so we're going to move on, uh, Provost, to this next question that has come in. Can you give us some of your understanding of the current plan to reorganize the Student Housing Services Office? What is the time frame? Will housing staff be involved in discussions? And when will the questions previously posed by housing staff be addressed? Hmm. Uh, the last question I'm not familiar with. I'm not familiar with questions posed by housing staff. So um, the, uh, the, the short version is um, that there has been a decision that we can better take care of our housing infrastructure, the buildings, um, by having our campus facilities team take that, that on. It's a major new responsibility for the team and I, I really can't say enough uh, to uh, Jan Gavea and her team for agreeing to take that on, a uh, very complex um, undertaking, um, but they have shown um, remarkable ability to, to refresh our campus, to modernize our campus. Um, uh, the brand new Life Sciences building is extraordinary. Gorgeous. As is the uh, six month build on a new stadium. So, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, we have tremendous expertise um, that can be brought to bear to uh, to bringing our student housing uh, up to the quality that it needs to be. Um, uh, frankly, it is not right now, and we all know that. Um, so uh, we need to get we need to get to work, and uh, and that team is is the team that we believe um, can um, best be brought to bear to to solve uh, the issues that we have with student housing. I think uh, after. Uh, Certainly a couple of years, I expect that there will be dramatic improvements in the, in the student housing infrastructure. Exciting, lots of moving parts. And yeah. of course, that is just newly developed information. And we would also like to uh, go down the list here. Um, maybe uh, Lee can lead off with, with helping us answer this. Um, what are the quar quarantine requirements for out-of-state students? who intend on returning in the spring semester, should we prepare for a couple days of quarantine during the process of moving in? Provost or Lee, whichever. I don't think they've changed, right? No, nothing, yeah, nothing, nothing has changed, has changed uh, at, at this point. Uh, the students, returning students, are treated in exactly the same way mm -hmm. as a returning resident. Uh, so there is no requirement to quarantine and we don't expect to, to put one in. Um, right. You know, the, uh, we believe that our students have behaved in a really responsible way. They and their families have been remarkable throughout this entire pandemic. Um, hats off to all of them. So uh, we have confidence in the students, their families, and in our housing staff and in university mm -hmm. services. Uh, medical services. Um, you know, I, so uh, we, we are confident we don't we don't need to introduce new quarantine requirements. Okay. Um, will there be opportunities for unvaccinated students to attend in-person sessions for the fall 2022 semester? Just hoping that you folks would consider unvaccinated students as we are not the virus. Please advocate for us. Mahalo. Well, the requirements and the, the um, the policies have been made known for many months, uh, really almost from the beginning of the fall semester. Uh, and as we've discussed before, we certainly we certainly understand, but it is really absolutely the safest thing to do is to make sure that we continue to have a fully vaccinated campus. And so those students uh, certainly are willing, are, are able to request a religious exemption or a medical exemption, but it has to go through the process. Uh, and but that that should have been uh, completed already. They needed to do that before they could register for the spring. So, 
Thank you, Lee. Uh, you know, now we're going to head on over to actually answer some questions that have uh, we've received in the last few months that were uh, sent to our help email. We would receive uh, multiple emails, uh, you know, asking basically the same questions. So, so we are going to paraphrase through some of them. Um, we are looking at uh, general, generally at the spring 2022 semester, Provost. Um, this one asking most colleges on the mainland return to in-person instruction in fall 2020, if not earlier. Why has it taken UH Manoa so long to return to in-person <clears throat> instruction? So our students who are not from here came here because we have something unique to offer. Um, uh, it's a unique environment um, here in the middle of the Pacific with uh, unparalleled access to unique uh, um, nature, unique learning experiences, uh, whether it's marine sciences, um, astronomy, medicine, um, in, a, in the most diverse um, population in, in the U.S., um, um, the bridge between East and West, right? Um, we are also unique in our capacity in our healthcare systems. Um, in our ability to, on uh, short notice, uh, provide um, in perhaps emergency medical supplies and even em emergency medical personnel, nurses and the like. Um, and so we are not like every place. And it is unfair to compare us, frankly, to a mainland university. It's simply unfair. Um, when we had to go to online, it was because our hospitals were filling. When we um, had a plan to go more fully in person and the Delta variant took our cases from 10 a day to 1,000 a day, um, our health systems were um, almost at a, uh, a breaking point. We all know with uh, tents out in front of the hospitals, these were scary, scary uh, visuals for every every one of us um, in that context how in the world could we um, safely um, and and uh, effectively reopen our campus to in-person instruction we could not and and for uh, whoever wrote that message and for anyone else who is thinking along those lines the health of our community is the number one and will never not be number one. Uh, students and our employees and the broader community, um, uh, our utmost concern is their health. And um, we're simply not like everywhere else. We can't put someone who is sick and cannot have access to a bed, we can't put them in an ambulance and drive them to a neighbor state. And we can't put them on an airplane. And, and so the thought, mm -hmm. the thought of, of arriving at that point is, is very scary for us. And knowing that we are responsible for the health of our students and our employees um, means that um, we had to retreat to a much higher level of online learning than we had it intended to. Um, we're going back to in person in the spring um, and we are mindful of the, this new variant, but again, we think that with vaccinations, masks, and our other protocols, we can have a safe learning environment and a safe working environment. Sure. And previously, a, a lot to consider, you know, before uh, those decisions were made to go back to mm -hmm. an open campus. So thank you so much, Provost. Um, we're going to move on through until uh, this next question coming in. What do I do if I signed up for a hybrid course, but the class never actually meets in person? Can I get a refund for what I paid for that course? Okay, if that happens, I need to hear about it. Because the fact is that those courses that are hybrid should have on their syllabus the dates, the exact days and times on which that course will meet in person. 
if, if those dates and times are not listed, then that is, uh, that is going against our, our protocol. So uh, um, I would want to hear about that, and, and, and uh, our, our team will, will respond. So sure. that should never happen. Okay. Uh, we're going to transition over into some questions that touch upon vaccinations and exemptions. Uh, we're looking at, um, you know, a lot of these questions that are coming in are, are multi-pronged in, in some uh, fashion. So we've paraphrased a lot that um, have been coming into the eForum website. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, all of these questions that have come in over the past several months, really, uh, a lot of them sometimes we forward to you, Lee, for your guidance to answer them. And um, sometimes we, we also tap on your team shoulders, uh, Provo, so we thank you so much for that. Uh, this one coming in touches upon uh, what percentage of students and employees have received medical exemptions and religious exemptions? And I think, Provost, you touched mm -hmm. upon that a little earlier, but in case some of our viewers are just joining us and maybe weren't there off the top, if you could revisit uh, some of those numbers. Yeah, uh, thanks. As, as of this morning, uh, with, with nearly 14,000 students registered at Manoa, um, only 2% of that 14,000 have uh, asked for and been approved for exemptions. So it's a very low number. I don't have the number for the employees. Um, and I, I'm, I know that our employees' uh, vaccination rates are very high. Mm -hmm. They're, they exceed 90%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I expect that the, uh, the percentage of requests for exemptions is also low. I don't know, Lee, if you've heard any. Yeah, across the system, I think uh, when we were in our meeting uh, yesterday, uh, across the entire system, all 10 campuses, it's really about 150 of all of, of, all of the employees. And so that's a, a pretty low percentage. Sure. Um, and uh, so, you know, and the rest are really pretty high vaccination rates among the uh, employees. Um, and this is both UH and RCUH employees combined, so. Okay. Uh, what needs to be provided, Provost, to receive a medical or religious exemption and who reviews and ultimately approves exemptions? Well, that depends if you, on if you are a student or an employee. So students at Manoa uh, go through our university health services. Uh, and they have a process and forms. Uh, the medical form needs to be filled out by a physician. Um, and so that's the process for students. For our employees, um, uh, we wanted a, a unified mm -hmm. approach um, across, across the campuses. So our Office of Human Resources, which is a system office, has assembled a committee um, that will examine the uh, request for medical, which has to, again, be signed by a physician, or uh, sincerely held religious belief and uh, so they um, they have been reviewing those uh, requests and there is a form that has been posted mm -hmm. online for each of those types medical or religious um, readily available in the, and and uh, the individual fills that out if they need to have something signed they get it signed and they submit it to the committee sure. okay uh, what we're going to do now is, with these added questions, let's kind of go through what we call the lightning round. <laughs> uh, part two, our Hanaho of that. Um, we're just going to see how many we can get through throughout the uh, what's left of our forum this afternoon. So, um, Bruno, let's let's start you off with our first lightning round um, portion. Uh, what recourse do I have if my exemption request is denied? Is there an appeals process? Um, for the, uh, I, I don't know honestly where the uh, the committee uh, the, uh, from uh, human resources is with respect to appeals. So I'm not I'm not really able to give a definitive. Sure, we answer can get back that. to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we it should. It is an interactive process, though. So they do utilize the interactive process to go back and forth uh, with the employees. Um, because, so it, because it's an accommodation, right? Yeah. It's an accommodation request. So yeah. um, I know they do go through, a, through a, again, an interactive process to 
you know, have a discussion and learn more and, and other things. But okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Lee. Uh, next question: um, Does UH have the legal right to mandate COVID nineteen vaccines for students and employees? <clears throat> Um, the university, um, and this comes from our Office of General Counsel, has the legal authority to require vaccination or testing. Um, that authority comes from, um, we, we believe, um, both state and federal um, um, actions and policies. The, uh, the, the first uh, derives from the governor's emergency order. Um, and um, I did bring a, a copy of that order with me. Um, in the governor's emergency uh, order, uh, there is a statement, all persons entering, working, or providing services in any state facility utilized by employees of the executive branch of the state including contractors, volunteers, and members of the public shall comply with the requirements in the order. And, and in there is vaccination or proof of a negative test. Um, from the federal perspective, the EEOC, the Equal, Opp Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, has said from uh, last year that uh, once uh, approvals for uh, use of the vaccine were granted, um, that requiring vaccination does not violate EEO laws, assuming that accommodations are provided, to, to Lee's earlier point. So uh, we are providing those accommodations. So we believe that we are uh, being responsive to the governor's emergency order, and we are abiding by federal, federal. law. Okay. Thank you, Provost. Um, Let's uh, bring Lee into this um, question. You know, why is UH mandating vaccines when it is widely reported that fully vaccinated individuals are catching the Delta variant and perhaps the Omicron variant? Sure. So um, this is similar to a question that was, uh, you know, asked earlier. Uh, and yes, it's, it's true that breakthrough infections. So here we're talking about breakthrough, which is the term reserved for when a fully vaccinated person gets infected with the virus. Uh, and, you know, as these uh, variants uh, become, they mutate, that's how they become variant. Um, and the virus's entire purpose is to survive, right? And so, so having these mutations are, are really expected. This is what happens in, in nature. Um, uh, but the difference is that if someone is fully vaccinated, yes, they can get it but it's still, they're still less likely to get it compared to an unvaccinated person and even compared to someone who previously had COVID. So when you look at the different studies, uh, while uh, people do get breakthrough, it's at a lesser amount or lesser percentage compared to those never vaccinated or those who had COVID infection previously and never got vaccinated afterwards. Um, and then, uh, and yes, with the Omicron, that is showing you know, to be the case. But the important thing to remember is that the vaccines were designed uh, really primarily to prevent serious disease, hospitalization, and death. And so even with this new Omicron variant, uh, you know, there is still tremendous protection against serious disease, hospitalization, and death. The other thing that's important to note is, and, and now there's a pretty, pretty good proof of this because the Delta has been around everywhere for quite a long time, is that if someone uh, has a breakthrough infection with Delta and they're fully vaccinated, their course is shorter, their symptoms are milder, um, and because their course is shorter, they're actually less, less uh, they're not able to transmit for as long a period compared to someone who's unvaccinated. So an unvaccinated person who gets it uh, will be highly infectious. They, their immune system doesn't recognize the virus and they will be infectious for nine or 10 days. Uh, whereas if you're fully vaccinated and you have the breakthrough, you get a breakthrough infection, your symptoms are gonna be milder. You still are contagious, which is why you have to isolate and other things. Um, but you're, you're not gonna be infectious. You're gonna stop being infectious 
quicker because your body has the vaccine and has these things called memory cells, uh, which really just activate and, you know, it takes a few days, but it remembers. It's like, oh, this is a really bad thing. Let me get rid of it, right? And so, again, that's why the vaccination is really, really important because that memory, the memory cell effect is, is so critical to the immune response. Interesting how you break everything down for <laughs> us. Um, also, this one coming in, you know, is UH, because I think you talked about this, Lee, about the importance or the research that is showing the effectiveness of the booster shots. Is UH considering requiring the COVID-19 booster that. shots? Why can't we add our booster shot information as well to the Lumacyte UH app? So a multi-pronged question, mm -hmm. but... Sure. So I, I also tried to um, upload my, my booster and, and could not. Uh, but, but part of the reason, it's the definition of full vaccination. And so the definition is still uh, 14 days after the completion of your primary series. And so if you've gotten the mRNA vaccine, which is the Pfizer or the Moderna, then 14 days after the second dose is when you're considered fully vaccinated. If you got the Johnson Johnson or Janssen vaccine, then 14 days after the first dose is when you're considered fully vaccinated. So CDC hasn't changed that definition. Uh, and as more information is obtained from again, studies around the world and in the US, um, then we'll see you know, if that definition does change. But at the moment, um, the Lumicide is really based on the definition of full vaccination because that's what the policy is based on. And so that's why we don't have the capacity to up the, the booster uh, because it's it's really based on that full vaccination and for the first question are we considering a requirement um, you know we're always thinking about it but really waiting for uh, for the evidence uh, and uh, you know we know that there are a lot of people out there that um, maybe have had more difficulty getting the vaccine right and so we also want to be very cognizant that the primary uh, push all around the world and in the country is really to make sure there's vaccine first for those who are unvaccinated. Um, and what you know, the CDC data shows, uh, I, I, think, I think the World Health Organization was worried that the richer countries like the US or the UK would hog all the vaccines and there wouldn't be enough. Uh, what, what's actually been shown is that you know, there, there have been enough boosters um, and, and, but, but there's been, in some countries, it's, been, it's just been a slow rollout, you know. Um, uh, and so uh, we're still very much encouraging the boosters. I, I think as we all learn more about the Omicron variant, that's going to be even a, a stronger push. Uh, you know, the FDA and the CDC did approve boosters for 16 and above. And so, um, you know, strongly recommending it, um, but not requiring it at this time. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Um, also, another qu question for you. Uh, why is it recommended that those who recovered from the COVID-19 uh, virus still get vaccinated? Great question. We hear that one a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a common question. Uh, and, you know, early on in the pandemic, I must say the evidence wasn't really clear, you know. Um, and uh, it's true that uh, in most people, if you get some sort of infection, you're gonna make antibody responses to it. But as the pandemic has gone on and all of these research, uh, research trials have been done you know, all over the world, um, it's, it's been pretty definitively shown that if you had a natural, um, if you had a natural COVID infection, your antibodies really don't last quite as long. Um, and from all these other studies, like the breakthrough studies, um, there's a pretty clear delineation. And so, so people who had COVID but did not get the vaccine, they're getting reinfected at higher rates compared to those who did get the vaccine. And so that reinfection rate and the comparison is really what is why the recommendation is so strong. Um, and so, you know, once someone has had COVID, uh, they are uh, going to test positive for 90 days, which is why the clearance is not test based. Um, and, uh, and but people are encouraged to get the vaccine, you, you know, um, after they've recovered. Uh, some earlier guidance was that you can, you know, you're immune generally for 90 days and so you could wait. Um, but but really, and especially now with this new Omicron, uh, you know, uh, really, I, I would say within a month or so after you get COVID, just go ahead and, and mm -hmm. schedule that first shot. Sure. Because uh, it's going to take time to, you know, to build up that good immune response. Okay. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Provost Bruno, you know, what happens if an unvaccinated student with an exemption who comes to campus tests positive for COVID-19? 
We have protocols uh, in place. What would happen is that University and Medical Services, mm -hmm. our co COVID response team, um, would get involved with uh, both contact tracing and caring for that student. Um, uh, in most cases, the student would be uh, would be placed in a um, one of our uh, um, isolation. isolation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I sure. won't say quarantine, isolation, um, hotels, uh, you know, happily we haven't had great use for, for uh, those, those hotel rooms. Um, and then we will uh, make sure that that student is attended to. And um, we also would work with that student's uh, faculty uh, for their various courses. I have to say our faculty have been great in in uh, making sure that the student continues to learn and doesn't lose any time or fall back um, because two weeks lost is is really a long time in a, any in any course so so we'll make sure the student stays on track and uh, and then the student comes back into into the environment so um, yeah we hope it doesn't happen of course but uh, but we are more than prepared. We've been dealing with situations like that um, since the fall of 2020. Sure, sure. And the other thing just to note is whether you're fully vaccinated or unvaccinated, the isolation period is the same. If you test positive, you test positive. And so you need to be isolated. Uh, but there's also a clearance form that needs to be um, signed by, by a physician and, and other things. So again, all of that information is available on the uh, Manoa Student Health Services site. Well, what happens if a student or employee refuses to get vaccinated and comes to campus? Where should this be reported? And I think you did touch upon this, uh, Provost. What disciplinary actions can be taken? You know, I, I, again, we, we don't want um, situations to, to escalate. So uh, Lee and I and... and our team have discussed over the last month um, the need to uh, communicate uh, with our community um, in this month and um, the beginning of next month as we all come together for the first time in nearly two years. <laughs> yeah. And for many people, it will be their first time on this campus in nearly two years. Uh, they will see colleagues they haven't seen in that long. Um, and so uh, we just want to make sure that people are mindful of each other and thoughtful and respectful. Uh, someone might forget to put on a mask when they walk into uh, a building. We can gently remind them. Um, and uh, people might have different views on vaccination or whatever, but uh, so there needs, to be, uh, there needs to be respect and empathy. Um, and, and we're going to continue to communicate that. Um, if, however, there is a consistent um, um, behavior uh, that violates our policy, um, if it is a student, um, then you know, we, have, we have a team that will investigate in our student success area um, uh, because that would be a violation of the student code of conduct. If it is an employee, um, there are many options. We have anonymous options like the whistleblower. Um, you know, there are direct options like uh, going to a supervisor in the office, to a dean or an associate mm -hmm. dean. Um, um, the last thing we want is employees confronting one another or escalating a situation. Um, you know, I think I think we uh, we have to lead with empathy and 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 respect and I I have a, a lot of faith in this community that that um, uh, we won't have uh, many if uh, if any instances of intentional sure. violation of our policies I don't know if Lee has yeah no I think I think that's right that's how you know it's it's I forget my mask sometimes I, in the same way I forget my badge it's like oh my gosh right so then you just go back to your car or always have, an, I always have an extra mask with me. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, if the behavior is disruptive and like Provost said, if it's a repetitive, intentional 
that's disruptive behavior. And so then the, the policies for disruptive behavior would need to be followed, whether it's an employee or a student. So. Sure. But we really do hope. Uh, and you know, we're, I was just uh, chatting uh, with a colleague over lunch today and just, you know, the difference of, of being here, everyone is still very nice and, you know, wears a mask, it's no big deal, we are respectful, we watch our physical distancing. Going to, to the mainland sometimes where transmission rates are really high and no one is wearing a mask and they look at you funny, it's a really different feeling. And so mm -hmm. we're just, uh, again, really lucky to live in Hawaii, literally. Yeah, sure. for many reasons. Sure. Yeah, and like you said, uh, provost as well, respect, very important. You know, um, aloha as well, asking mm -hmm. our community to really remember that when you come back um, this spring. Okay, uh, I think that you also had mentioned, um, you know, some of the options that, that uh, individuals have if, if they do see, you know, intentional uh, behavior, right? Um, are construction workers required to follow the same COVID-19 rules as students and employees? What about the employees of delivery services like UPS and the U.S. Postal Service? On the face of it, that's a yes and a no. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, so, um, you know, outside consultants and, and I would put uh, construction workers in that category who are on campus for extended time. periods of time. So measured in hours, not minutes, those individuals must conform to mm -hmm. our full vaccination or weekly testing. They must um, uh, load information onto Lumisite and show, show that proof uh, when coming to campus. A person delivering mail, no. Uh, for it, we we thought that, that it'd be just <laughs> awkward. Yeah, and, just, uh, they just have to keep their mask on. That's really the main thing, because they're not gonna be there, they're gonna drop off, right? Very limited um, person interaction, and that's the key. Okay. Well, we are uh, inching our way towards um, the uh, latter part of our uh, forum. And, you know, before we, we close off, um, uh, you know, for this spring 22, 2022, can't even say it, I can't believe it's gonna be 2022, <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, but uh, any major takeaways? Um, I'll start off with you, Lee, maybe that, that you have had um, you know, experiencing being a part of this COVID-19 pandemic response team here at the university um, through all of that and, and where we are now. Any words that you may have? Sure, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a lot of work, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's been an honor and, and a privilege. And I think when, when we at the, at the medical school were able to bring our students back, I mean, that's, that was really the, the joy. Right, and, and so, um, in fact, uh, on Wednesday, we had all four classes of medical students in the same building at the same time, uh, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. It was loud, but it was amazing. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that's what we're here for, right? And so I think the key is that we have uh, really worked very, very hard to make sure that uh, the policies are in place and clear. Um, uh, the IT team has worked incredibly hard to uh, try to make things as easy as possible. It's, it's frankly amazing what they do. Um, and, and so I think it's really just all of us really pulling together, uh, but remembering that, you know, in order to stay safe, we all have a responsibility. Uh, and so, um, and the, the last thing I, I would say though, uh, again, strongly recommended, because you know, a lot of people, including myself, we're gonna travel for the holidays. Um, and so it's not required uh, for, for others than, than people who work in the hospital. Um, but strongly consider getting uh, tested on day five after you return from travel. Sure. Uh, just because, you know, uh, many of us are gonna go to places where there's high community transmission because the U.S. is still having very high community transmission. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you can, it would just be the, the safer thing to do. Yeah, better to be safe, yeah. 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 Mahalo Lee. Uh, Provost, any any final words or major takeaways that, that you would like to share with us as well? I would mostly echo what Lee just said. Um, the, the only thing that comes to my mind is thank you. Uh, thank you for those who are watching our, our faculty and staff and, and our students in particular for, for persevering and, and showing aloha, demonstrating to the rest of the world how we can care for each other and keep each other safe through a, a global pandemic and at the same time 
break all sorts of records at our university, everything from enrollment to research. Um, it's been a challenging two years, but in a lot of ways, something really uh, extraordinary and something to be proud about, so thank you. Mahalo Nui to you both for all mm -hmm. of your hard work and commitment uh, to the University of Hawaii at Manoa as well as across the system. You know, we thank you so much for being with us and we thank you as well for spending this time with us on this Aloha Friday afternoon. Uh, that is uh, a wrap for us here in the College of Social Sciences digital studio. Uh, a round of applause as well to our students. Our students have been working behind the cameras, working behind the scenes as well, uh, rolling teleprompter for us too, and powdering our noses, all of that in between. Excellent, excellent uh, haumana that we have with us as well. So on that note, we wish you a happy and healthy holiday season. Uh, signing off from the CSS Digital Studios here on the UH Manoa campus. Aloha. Aloha.